Good morning. Good morning. All right. It is so good to see all of you. It is good to see those of you here in person. It is good to see our front row people. It is good to know, but not see, for me, our real front row people, the people joining us online, each of whom has a front row seat. It is good to be back in the building. Amen. We, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to worship at First Unitarian Church of Rochester. We know that church is not a building, it's a people with a mission. It is all of us, and our mission is through spiritual connection in community. We listen deeply to others and ourselves. We open to wonder and transformation, and we serve together with love and humility. We know we are not a building, but it is so good to be here. And here where our building stands, we acknowledge with respect that these are the ancestral grounds of the Seneca people, keepers of the Western Door and part of the Haudenosaunee. Here at First Unitarian, we welcome each other. And if you are new or newish here, we invite you to connect with our folks in the lobby or fill out the connection card online so that we can help you make more connections here. And if you've been here for a while and you think you could make more connections here, I invite you to say hello to someone, to strike up a conversation, to stick around after the service, online or in person, and help those connections go deeper here at First Unitarian. I'm the Reverend Sherry Halliday Kwan. I'm the lead minister, but I'm not the only one leading worship today. We are especially excited to welcome Reverend Eileen Casey Campbell, who's the minister of our Canandaigua congregation. I see some people waving, but let's give Eileen a warm welcome. And E.J. Santos is helping lead worship, Tommy and Brock and Bill. We've got three music directors from three different congregations bringing music today. It always takes a team. Our hospitality greeters, our tech people, and all of you make worship happen. It wouldn't be Sunday morning for me without all of you. And we've got some special guests today. Through the month of December, our congregation for over a decade now has been engaging in the spiritual practice of making sacrifices in our own holiday spending for the greater good. And so I'd like to invite up members of our greater good committee for a special presentation. Thank you, Jenny and Eleanor. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we are terribly excited to be here. This is, I'm Jenny Gall, I'm part of the Greater Good Committee, as well as my daughter, Eleanor. And uh, we're here to tell you that we have raised just a whole lot of money for these two, can these two uh, organizations. And we're going to be welcoming uh, Ellen Smith of Keeping Our Promise and Meg Joseph of Friends of Gnadigan, along with Ansley uh, Jemison, the cultural liaison of the Gnadigan Historic Site, to join us on the stage so that we can present them uh, with their checks. So um, we have raised, our congregation, through our generosity and sacrifice, we've raised over $21,000 for each organization. And I, I and the rest of the Greater Good Committee are so very grateful for your um, sacrifice and your support of these phenomenal organizations and their programs. So we're going to turn over the mic to these folks, and they're going to share a little bit with us about what's coming up. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good morning. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Ansley Jemison. I'm a member of the Seneca Nation. Um, I gave you a traditional welcoming to the original homeland and territory of the Seneca people. Um, I'm a member of the Wolf Clan, which is uh, my matrilineal uh, lineage to my, through my mother. And I'm originally from the Allegheny, Terry of, Allegheny Territory of, the, of Western New York. So I recently took on the role here at Ganondigan, and I'm serving in the cultural liaison position. Um, a little bit kind of a wide spectrum in terms of what my role can be and what I can do. But um, something came to my mind while I was here and kind of, you know, learning more about the program, learning more about Ganondigan and having grown up there, things have changed quite a bit since I've been there. And um, I've been away for a little while. I was working um, down at Cornell University for a while and coming back, and I was working with the Educational Opportunity Program, EOP, and working with low-income first-generation students primarily. And it came to my mind and my thought that there's a lot of people in the world who are here in, you know, in and around the Rochester area, um, and, and just really in, in the United States, I guess, that have never been traditionally welcomed by the original people of North America, the indigenous people, the indigenous populations. And so in our, in our practices, we have this process called the edge of the woods. And before anybody would come to our village, they would set up a camp outside of our village and they would set up a fire and they would you know, send a messenger over to try to have some sort of an audience with whoever the people were in the community. And usually they would come with a message and they would wanna talk about different things. But before we would go through that, we would put them through sort of a cleansing ceremony, a small condolence is what they would call it. And essentially what it is is that as people are traveling and as they're coming, they may take on some burdens, they may have some challenges, they may have some issues along the way. And so what we do is we'll take a, a, a gentle cloth, maybe like a, a, a fawn's hide or something like that, and we would start with first wiping away the tears of their eyes and letting them be able to see the world clearly again. And then the next thing, we would give them a, a, a sip of water and help their throat be cleared as well. And then lastly, we would go in and we would clear their ears with like an eagle's plume and be able to let them hear the birds and hear the voices and hear different things. And part of this is a mourning as well that people would go through after like somebody would pass and things like that. But this was also a process that we would put somebody through in order for them to better see, hear, and, 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 um, and uh, listen to basically anything that would be told to them or shared with them within our communities. And so what has happened is that we have young people that are on our territory. They're about 13 years old. This is back in the, on our home, home reservations. And they're in this place where they're too young to be able to be employable to get jobs, but they're also too old to be a part of a recreation program, which would be like an after school program. So there's this gentleman that's taken on some of these children and kind of given them some life skills. He takes them into the woods, teaches, teaches them shelter building and things like that, or any kind of skills that they may need, maybe hunting skills and things. And the one thing that's kind of lacking with them is some of them are very not connected to their community, connected to their culture, even though they live on the reservation, which would make sense that they may, but they may have been removed from that because of boarding schools or you know sort of things that may have happened to their families. So we're gonna welcome them back to Ganondigan, which is our original home site, our original territory. So we're gonna welcome them back. The word that we have for our people is Onundawatga, the people of the Great Hill, which is down in Canandaigua. And so we're gonna welcome them back to, to this area and reacquaint them and kind of wipe away the tears and wipe, wipe away maybe some of that anxiety and that shame about not knowing about self. And we're gonna welcome in also our brothers from the African-American communities and also the Latino communities as well because some of them have been stolen, some of them been, have been called illegals. And the indigenous people of North and Central and South America are these people and they're our brothers. You know? So we wanna welcome them to our territory and let them know that they have a safe place, that they have a place at Ganondigan and they're being traditionally welcomed by the Onondawaka people, the, the Seneca people. So this is the project that we're gonna be working on. We're gonna be working with these young people about some life skills, reacquainting them with their culture, getting them connected back to this area and letting them know that this is a home, but also extending the rafters and welcoming our African-American brothers and sisters as well and, and, and also re-welcoming the, the Latino families as well and just reacquainting them to their indigeneity. And so this is essentially what the program is. I was just back in our home communities the last um, four or five days. We're having our midwinter ceremonies right now, which is our, sort of our renewal ceremonies and our Thanksgiving for all of the things that have passed in the last year. And I was talking to some folks that I think that would be very instrumental in this program. So 
clearly some of the funds and things like that are going to go to help um, with their travel and things like that and whatever that may be that we're going to need to use. Um, and part of the program is we're going to take these students on a paddle um, trip or expedition up Canandaigua Lake and to the base of Bear Hill, which is where we trace our origin to, and just really reacquaint these young people with that area. So there's going to be some life skills, some endurance uh, testing and things like that, and just sort of some fun and uh, getting kids away from screens for a, a time, you know, and just getting them outside. So uh, that's, that's the plan. So um, in our language, we say um, nyawe, and that means thank you. So I appreciate um, your generosity. I appreciate you. Um, inviting me to this space to be able to join with you today, and um, Yahweh. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ellen Smith from Keeping Our Promise. This is an organization that started uh, eight years ago in March when I was asked if I could help a U.S. Army captain um, just gather some um, household goods for his uh, interpreter and family that was coming into Syracuse, New York. Uh, since then, we've helped over 600 people resettle um, in the Rochester area. And um, these are Iraqis and Afghans and some Kurds that worked for the US military or USAID um, or some of the programs that USAID funded like skate -stan or Free to Run, programs that empowered women in Afghanistan. Um, with the fall of Kabul, um, we have just seen a tremendous amount of need um, here in our community. And to give you an idea, our intake numbers have gone up 400% from what we had anticipated last year. Um, we have 254 individuals on our caseload list here in Rochester. These are all Afghans who have fled the war. And since uh, the evacuation in August, um, it's been 220 Afghans have come in, totaling 54 families. Uh, since January 1st, we've had 14 families that have, we have helped resettle here in Rochester. As you know, life in Afghanistan for a woman is generally one of almost slave-like conditions. Um, if they're in an area controlled by the Taliban um, and not in one of the cities, um, they tend not to leave the house. Um, they are, if, if they leave, they have to be escorted and coming to America is really hard for a lot of these women because of the openness. And you would think that they would be very happy and excited, but they're scared because it's, an, it's a freedom or openness that they've never experienced in their lives. One of the things that we found over the years is we have had a car grant program called Wheels for Work. And typically when a husband, because they're the ones who work, um, in this society. When they go to work, the women are left at home alone. They feel isolated. And what we started to learn was they really wanted to learn how to drive. But the men were afraid to teach their wives how to drive since the women have never been behind a wheel before. And they'll tell you that they don't even know how to fill a car up with gas. Um, in Afghanistan, they weren't even allowed to sit in the front seat. They had to sit in the second row. So part of our program is to get these families vehicles. They need 100 hours of volunteer community service to qualify for Wheels for Work. Um, and they need a prospect of employment. So they need to be ready. And that means that they need to know some English. We have a lot of people who, for instance, were guards or maintenance workers or worked at housekeeping in the staff or at the bases around Afghanistan and Iraq. And they simply don't know English, and they need to learn English. But Wheels to Work and empowering women to learn to drive are two. Um, it's part of our foundation building with our program. Without a car, you simply can't get ahead in Rochester. You can't get to the better jobs in the suburbs 
We've had people offered jobs in Webster or in Victor that were well paying, but it was impossible to get to with a bus. So empowering people to learn to drive and then getting them a very modest vehicle is the foundation they need to build a better life here in Rochester. The people that we started helping seven years ago in our program are now citizens and eight of them are now homeowners. They've done a tremendous amount by having a good foundation. And this is what you as a congregation are contributing to with our program, is helping build this foundation for an unprecedented number of evacuees from Afghanistan coming into our community. So on behalf of those families and the women that we seek to help, thank you very much for choosing our program for the greater good. Thank you all, and Angelie and Meg and Ellen, I think you're off to spend some time with our children upstairs. The rest of us, we're stuck with our annual sex sermon, so <laughs> you'll have to have all the fun without us. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you all for being a part of what makes worship happen. And part of the way we open our ritual of being together is by lighting our chalice. So EJ will lead our words here in the sanctuary, but I invite you all to join in unison. If you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light one wherever you are, and Eleanor will light ours here in the sanctuary. All right. Let's take a breath together as we settle into the sacred time and place. Please join me in our chalice lighting by lighting a chalice wherever you are and saying our unison words. May the flame we now kindle inspire us to use our power to heal with love, to help with compassion, to bless with joy, and to seek liberation in the fullness of community. Good morning. Good morning. Let's get right into it. The first time I found out about sex, it was to win an argument, which if you know me a little or have, let's say, ever been married to me, you are probably not surprised about. But I was maybe six or seven years old, and my friend from daycare, let's call her Stacy, had a new niece. Her older sister had just had a baby, and Stacy was just enamored with her new niece and talked about her a lot and mentioned at daycare that her niece had a mom, but she didn't have a dad. And I didn't think that was possible. So we argued about it. And then we went home, and as ignorant as I was, I was still a pretty big nerd. And so like a normal child, maybe would go to their parents for more information about this. Not me. I went to the library, and I strode up to the librarian's desk with a whole lot of undeserved confidence, and I said, I need to know how babies are made. And bless her heart, she walked me to the children's section and brought me to an age-appropriate picture book that explained the mechanics of procreative sex. And I checked that book out and I brought it to daycare the next day, <laughs> thinking I will conclude this argument being right with Stacy. You might be unsurprised to find out it did not conclude our argument. Stacy and I continued to argue. My actions escalated the argument <laughs> to the point where our daycare provider had to step in. It was getting so heated. And she was taken aback to find out what it was we were arguing about and what kind of literature I had brought with me to daycare. <laughs> so she looked at the book and 
bless her heart, she said, listen, yes, this book is correct, Eileen. It takes two humans to make a baby, but that does not mean that every family has two parents in it. And here's the more important thing. Look at your friend. You're hurting her feelings. It is not okay to try and tell someone else what their own life and their own family looks like. And you need to think about that before you try to be right. And I think, in some ways, that's why we come to church. <laughs> because we have to be able to talk about sex, and we have to be able to talk about boundaries. We have to be able to talk about sex with boundaries. And we're going to do both today. I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so glad you're here in person and you're here from home. Let's get started this morning. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex for now. To the people at home in the crowd, it keeps coming up anyhow. Don't be coy, avoid or make void the topic, cause that ain't gonna stop it. Now we talk about sex. On the radio and video shows Many will know anything goes Let's tell how it is and how it could be How it was and of course how it should be Those who think it's dirty have a choice Pick up the needle, press pause, or turn the radio off Will that stop us, Pep? I doubt it All right then, come on, spin Let's talk about sex, baby Let's talk about you and me Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. 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 I want to invite you now into a time of meditation and centering, followed by some shared silence. So wherever you sit, I ask you to get comfortable there. Let some part of you find the floor, the chair you're sitting in, your couch at home, or your bed, no judgment. Feel supported by this good earth. Let's take a deep breath. I show up and there's always coffee ready. How, I do not know. Not leftover early morning coffee now cold and burnt in the pot, but good fresh coffee in its little French press wrapped in a soft towel to stay warm. That I know she brewed with the same tender care with which she brews her every word. Come on in she'll invite. There's coffee ready if you want it. Heavy cream will sit in a little metal pitcher beside a jar of turbinado sugar. Sweet delicacies of one kind or another will inevitably adorn the kitchen table. Hallowed offerings when just a sip of water would do. There's always coffee ready if I want it. How, I do not know. She would tell you, deferentially, she just drinks too much coffee. It's always fresh. She eats too many sweets. They're always around. But I know better. I know she lives out her devotion to a love that encircles us all in its wide embrace by doing the same. I know that she has knitted together a life of radical invitation with those gentle hands. I know her most fervent prayer to the love that leaves no one out, the love that knocks and waits for us to answer, is come on in. There's coffee ready if you want it.
held by this good earth, held in this community. We talk about the things that are important, present or absent in our lives, held by the good earth and this community. We bear witness to all that happens, the grief, the growth, the gratitude that lives within us. And if you're online, I invite you to type now into the chat whatever it is that's on your heart that you bring to our gathering. And here, physically, in our space, I invite you, if you come into our time and space with something on your heart that you would like others to bear witness to, a sorrow, a growth, or something for which you have only abundant thanks. I invite you to rise and approach the bowls in the center aisles, lifting a stone and dropping it gently into the water, feeling and then releasing its weight. May we be witnesses to each other. May all released, may all witnessed, and may all carried silently in our hearts be held with grace, with ease, and with love. Amen.
Each week, members and friends generously contribute to our offering, which helps to sustain and grow our community. This collection supports the work and witness of our church, and each week, we give half of this collection to a partner organization, helping those in need and working to create a more just and loving world. This week, we are sharing the plate collection with our school's partnership. Volunteers from our congregation partner with teachers at School 15 and School 22 to provide supportive presence in the lives of our students. You can give online at rochesterunitarian.org donate or by Venmo or here in person in our offering boxes. Our offering will now be received with gratitude. Taking notes in the moonlight We'll lay down and harmonize I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you Ooh, Tell me what keeps you honest Tell me what keeps you inspired I'll always come in the morning We'll lay down and harmonize Tell me what moves you ready Tell me what moves you inside I'll bring the soul Bring the steady, we'll lay down and harmonize. I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you. I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you. I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you. Ooh. I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you. I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you. I'm awake for, I'm, a, I'm awake for you. So Reverend Sherry mentioned in a recent meeting that around Valentine's Day, she likes to give an, and I need you to know I'm quoting her here, annual sex sermon 
because, as she says, we should talk about sex at least once a year in church. Only she was in a predicament because she was supposed to be off this week. And the annual sex sermon seemed like maybe an unfair thing to assign to someone else. But I play a chaotic good character both in Dungeons and Dragons and in real life. So here I am. Before I knew what was what, I found myself volunteering for the annual sex sermon with, I'll be perfectly honest, zero context as to what it should entail. Now, I don't know how Reverend Sherry's sex sermons usually go, because your girl, the Chaos Goblin, literally did not think to ask. But buckle up this morning for one that is decidedly unsexy, which is fine, I think, really. I don't think sexy content is the reason we come to church. So let's talk about consent, baby. There's no doubt we've come a long way when it comes to talking about consent. Just a generation or two ago, it was actual honest-to-God law in most places that consenting to a marriage meant a woman gave her permanent blanket consent to any type of sex at any time. And now we're, most of us, pretty sure that's not the case. Consent is even sometimes part of our children's education, progress. But usually our conception of consent is as a yes or no answer to a single question about a narrow type of sex. We as a society are at like the middle school note passing maturity level here when it comes to consent. Sex, check yes or no. And believe it or not, I think we can do better. Incredible professionals like Sheila Shu are setting up our kids to do better with programs like OWL, and I think we can manage it too. So I want to tell you, and this is going to seem like a real divergence from the topic of annual sex sermon, but I promise it's not. Hang with me. I want to tell you about the rules we have in our home for our children's play. We have two kids, ages two and five, and mostly they have three rules for playing together. Number one, ask permission. Number two, wait to hear a yes. And number three, notice that everyone is enjoying themselves. So you see where I'm going, in that these are the foundation for sexual consent. These children's rules are somehow more explicit a lesson in good sex than the poster in my college dormitory hallway that simply said, consent is sexy. No context, no elaboration. That was all we got from the administration. There's somehow more in depth a lesson in good sex than the sum total of zero lessons on consent that I received during a school sexual education. And I was more lucky than many American kids in that I got an education in the mechanics of sex, straight sex, and to be honest, a really pretty narrow version of it. But I did not get an education in the mechanics of how to ask for or agree to sex. And it's not that my spouse and I value our kids' potential future sexual relationships so highly that we've embedded lessons about sexual ethics in their play. We do value them, but that's not the reason for these rules. It's that consent, particularly this kind of clear, mutual, enthusiastic consent, is the foundation for all healthy relationships. On the playground and in the bedroom and the workplace and the doctor's office and the school and the church, joyful mutual consent is the framework for loving one another well. Okay, so back to kid rule number one, ask permission. Meaning we ask permission before and during interactions. We ask in open-ended, non-coercive ways. Do you feel like playing puzzles right now? Yeah, do you wanna do the train puzzle? Oh, you don't wanna do the train puzzle? How about one of these? You can choose. And as we go along, we continue asking permission. Would you like to start with the corner pieces? That's how I like to do puzzles. In the context of sex, it sounds more like, here's what I like, you wanna try it? And also, how would you feel about such and such? I'm gonna trust you to fill in the details on such and such. <laughs> and in the context of church, it might be something like, I've got a cool story, do you have time to hear it? Or, I think you'd be great on the stewardship team, how do you feel about that? <laughs> that <was nice. laughs> 
Stewardship is sexy. We ask permission whenever we enter someone else's body bubble. This is how we talk about it with our kids. We want them to check in before touching or coming too close to another person's physical space. Hey, do you want a hug before bed? Can we cuddle while we read this book? Hey, brother, do you want to play indoor tag and drive our parents crazy? Cool. I have, for the record, never consented to indoor tag. Outside of childhood play, we should be checking in before we enter someone's physical space as well. In small platonic ways, like, is it okay if I sit here beside you? Are you comfortable with me taking my mask off now that we're outside? As well as, and long before, asking permission to enter someone's physical bubble in a sexual way. And we ask permission to enter someone's emotional bubble, too. Admittedly, this is harder to figure out. I'm a whole ass adult, and I'm still working on it. But it can sound like, do you want to talk about this right now, or do you need some time before you're ready? Do you mind if I tell Reverend Sherry what you've been going through? I see you're upset. Do you want me to try and help, or do you need to be left alone? I want to watch a Star War. Is that going to be too scary for you? Wow, thanks for sharing that hard thing. Is it okay if I ask you some questions about it? We ask permission like this. When we do that, when we do the work of mutual boundary setting, we're creating holy space around us and between us. This space that's made by the invitation to participate in consent is a space that honors our particularity as humans, I think. It acknowledges that we are particular and unique persons with particular gifts and particular needs, and that we know that our own gifts and needs are not universal. They belong to us and to no one else. Because while we are interwoven, interdependent, we are not one being. And asking permission marks the holy space of that bubble around ourselves, our bodies and our feelings. It marks the holiness of the space between us. Okay, so the second kid's rule, that's really a rule for everyone, wait to hear a yes. When we're building mutual consent, we're not waiting to hear the, now go along with whatever you want of codependency, because that dishonors the particularity of a person. We're not waiting to hear the half-hearted, I guess it'd be okay, that comes from someone unsure they can claim their own holy space, or the okay, okay, fine, that comes from someone who's being coerced whose emotional space has already been violated. We're waiting for a clear and certain yes that arises from the holy space within a person who knows their own gifts and needs, who values them in such a way that they can set a boundary. The boundaries we lay down separating my needs from your needs, my desires from your desires, my agency from yours are holy indeed. That space that a boundary delineates between us honors us as distinctive, differentiated persons. The blessing of a boundary is to say, this is where I end and you begin. But it's becoming easy to see how these seemingly simple rules actually are hard to adhere to in a real relationship, a family, a community, right? From the earliest age, we need practice. Because it doesn't come naturally to us in the context of the dominant culture here to relate to one another in this way. Even if, isn't, if it isn't necessarily your culture personally. If you're here this morning, I think it's probably safe to say that the culture you're steeped in is a white middle class culture, which is to say the culture of colonialism and white supremacy. If you live in this country, it's pretty impossible to avoid its impact. And one of its impacts is indirect communication, making assumptions instead of asking and waiting. One of its impacts is the reinforcement of power and control, a hesitancy to ask for what we want if we don't feel powerful enough, and an urge to just take it if we do. 
A hard time saying no to power means a hard time listening to a clear yes from within ourselves or from others. One of its impacts is a consumerism that runs so deep that we start to conceive of one another's bodies and attention and time as objects for our consumption. One of its impacts is disembodiment, a disconnection with our own bodies to the extent that we have trouble sustaining the imagined body bubble that tells us where we end and another person begins a disconnection so deep that we sometimes aren't sure what to ask for or to give in order to give our bodies joy and whether the feeling that we have in response is a yes or a no. And here's where we get to the good part, which is, I'm also, I'm sorry to say, also the hard part. Rule number three, notice that everyone is enjoying themselves. The first two rules, ask and wait for an answer, we might need to practice, but their existence as rules makes sense, yes? When I include them in consent building, I'm pretty much preaching to the choir here, right? But number three, in a culture that is inevitably impacted by colonialism and white supremacy, in a church that is inherited from Puritans, is so often left out altogether. Maybe we just take a moment and revel in the absurdity of leaving the joy out of consent. Because if there's anything that makes human sexuality and human play fundamentally human, it's enjoyment, delight, pleasure. So if you take nothing else away from the annual sex sermon this year, let it be this, you were made for joy. Part of the purpose of the third rule of this play is to remind my children that consent is fluid. It's ongoing. It's not check yes or no and move on, but something they should be aware of coming back to again and again. And joy should be the guide. The thing I agreed to a while ago, is it still bringing me joy? We ask ourselves. The thing my brother usually loves to do together, does it seem like he's enjoying it right now? And we can ask ourselves the same questions in all our relations. Is there joy in the space between us? Do I experience pleasure as a result of this interaction, this work, this conversation? And does it seem like these beloved humans on the other side of the holy space between us are delighting in it as well? I need you to know that what I do not mean is that we are never uncomfortable, uncertain, pushed to our growing edges, or held accountable in relationships? Do we need to be thrilled about every choice our partners, our playmates, our fellow congregants make? Hell no. What rule three means is that our own choices are guided by joy, not the absence of discomfort, which can masquerade as joy, but from that deep and steady reservoir of joy that bubbles up when you are your truest self. And that we allow space for beloved others to ask and answer from that deep well of joy too. And that is hard from within a cultural framework that tells us that most pleasure, but especially sexual pleasure, is a sin. Like, it sounds really simple, notice that everyone is enjoying themselves. But we cannot spend a lifetime being told sex is not for you to enjoy and then just casually take note of our embodied joy because we decided to. This one takes some doing, takes some undoing to be real about it. We will need to undo the hooks that dominant culture has sunk into our hearts, telling us that delight in our bodies is somehow wrong. We will have to practice being awake to and aware of our bodies, feeling our feelings inside our bodies. Once, years ago, my therapist asked me to scan my body and notice where my anxiety was showing up. And I said, huh, I don't really think about my feelings being in my body. And she leaned forward studiously like a good therapist and said, hmm, 
Where else would they be? Where else would they be? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> to follow rule number three, which children are actually really good at before we teach them not to be, by the way, we'll have to be okay with noticing our bodies. We cannot notice enjoyment without them. We cannot notice joy without being embodied because where else would it be? Consent building is vital to our sexual relationships and to our communities. As Unitarian Universalists, we structure our communities around covenants, around a holy question and answer, an invitation to consent. Can we make these promises to one another, we ask? Can we say yes to these ways of loving one another well? Will we find joy if we do? And it's not just some coincidence that this practice of asking and waiting for an answer happens to be good for us sexually and playfully and congregationally for all separate reasons. It's that in all its forms, this is what love looks like. Because love may leave no one out, but it does not force its way in. This is how loving relations work. When we relate to one another as humans, with love as the medium for our relations, as the holy space between us, it looks like consent. So let us, in all our relating to one another, make the invitation, wait for an answer, notice joy. May it be so, and amen. Thank you, Reverend Eileen. That was fantastic. And now we've got an opportunity to put it into practice. Not sex, but consent. You see, folks, it's been a while since we, the corporate body of this church, has raised its voice together in hymnody. And that broke my heart. And yet, knowing that we're going to have an opportunity today to sing together, as you're willing and able, fills me up with joy. And so in a minute, I'm going to invite you to rise in voice, body, and spirit and join us as you are willing and able in singing this closing hymn, Let It Be a Dance. If you're not feeling comfortable singing at, or you say, you know, I don't want to be in the room while folks are singing, you know, you are welcome to step out. You're welcome to, to find space. There's plenty here. And now this song is called Let It Be a Dance. So I imagine some of you might even be moved to dance. You are welcome to do that. And if you do choose to dance and you want to dance with a partner, please ask. Wait for a yes and pay attention. And there's plenty of space up here for dancing too. So now, after all I just said, I invite you to rise in voice, body, and spirit and join us in singing our closing hymn. Let it be a dance we do. Let's crank that up. May I have this dance with you. Through the good times and the bad times, too. Let it be a dance. Let a dancing song be heard. Play the music, say the words. And fill the sky with sailing birds. Let it be a dance. Let it be a dance. Let it be a dance. Learn to follow, learn to lead. Feel the rhythm, feel the need. To reap the harvest, plant the seed. Let it be a dance. Let it be a dance we do. May I have this dance with you. Through the good times and the bad times too. Let it be a dance. Everybody turn and spin. Let your body learn to bend. And like a willow with a wind. Let it be a dance. Let it be a dance. Let it be a dance. I love the dancing I'm seeing. This is great. A child is born, the old must die. A time for joy, a time to cry. Take it as it passes by. Let it be a dance. 
let it be a dance we do. May I have this dance with you through the good times and the bad times too. Let it be a dance. Morning star comes out at night. Without the dark, there is no light. If nothing's wrong, then nothing's right. Let it be a dance, let it be a dance, let it be a dance. Let the sunshine, let it rain. Share the laughter, bear the pain. And round and round we go again. Let it be a dance. We extinguish this flame, but not the true like the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. May we leave this place and be so awake to the well of joy within us that we are able to ask for what we desire and answer in truth. May love fill all the holy space between us.